is a videotape and story on Cullen Freestead Company and the legendary Burrow Crane. Cullen Freestead was founded on April 19, 1907 by Frank J. Cullen as a successor to his own contracting company known as Frank J. Cullen. The minority partner in the company was Luther P. Freestead, which accounts for the name Cullen Freestead. Freestead was bought out in 1908. This is Frank P. Cullen, one of the two sons of Frank J. Cullen. This is Frank J. Cullen, the grandson of Frank J. Cullen, the founder. Here is a picture of Frank P. Cullen and Frank J. Cullen, probably in 1953 or 1954, taken at the factory. This is a picture of one of the original Derrick cars, later known as a Model 10 Burrow Crane. This picture is at Telford, Pennsylvania on the Reading Railroad. We'll have more about this uh, later on. Here is the Santa Fe Railroad where they are using a burrow crane to relay rail on the main line between Chicago and Kansas City. Now we are at the Proviso rail yard of the Chicago Northwestern Railroad at Merrill's Park, Illinois. If you look closely in the background, you will see the old wooden bridge on Mannheim Road that crossed between North Avenue and St. Charles Road. Coming back to the Model 10, originally this machine was known as a Derrick car, and from the information we have been able to develop, the original crane was built to work on a bridge construction job that Cullen Freestead had on the Norfolk and Western Railroad somewhere in Virginia or West Virginia. The people on the Norfolk and Western saw this machine and decided that they wanted five of them and this launched the production of the Burrow Crane. From our records we were able to determine that cranes number two and three were built in June of 1924 and production increased rapidly thereafter. As you can see in the sequence here, we have shown the wheel and axle sets being unloaded and put into the store yard and then being reloaded from the store yard back onto a rail car. Now we are at Fort Wayne, Indiana on the old Pennsylvania Railroad, which was succeeded by Conrail as we know it today. This crane is filled with a clamshell bucket and they are loading used ties into a rail car for disposal. Frank J. Cullen, the contractor, had his offices at 617 Chamber of Commerce Building, Chicago. We haven't figured out what building that is. In 1907, with the founding of Cullen Freestead, the office was moved to room 1526 of the Tribune Building, 7 South Dearborn Street, where it stayed until April of 1918. This scene is another Burrow Crane with a clamshell bucket operating on the Burlington Railroad. This uh, scene is somewhere between Downers Grove and Hinsdale, and you will see that they are working between the two mainline tracks to cleaning the ditch with the clamshell bucket. Sometime in 1916, Colin Freestead bought property at 5435-47 West Roosevelt Road in Cicero and built a building. This location was across the street from the old Sunbeam plant and Rockney Stadium. Now we are on the old New York Central Railroad somewhere on the south side of Chicago, maybe at 63rd and Englewood, where the New York Central had a very large yard. The New York Central is also one of the railroads that is now part of Conrail. They are loading material with a clamshell bucket into a gondola, and you will see shortly that we are demonstrating the very short tail swing of the burrow crane. Here you can see that when the crane is turned crosswise to the rail track, 
a train can pass by without any interference. The short tail swing was unique to the burrow crane. No one else had such a feature. Colin Freestead's operation in Cisco did not last very long, most likely because the Thomas Railroad track was never brought to the facility. The property was purchased in 1918 at 1300 South Kilbourne Avenue, and in 1919, the, the original building, which was an office and machine shop, were built. The company continued to operate their Roosevelt Road facility until 1922, at which time everything was moved to Kilbourne Avenue. We're back on the Burlington Railroad again, this time uh, either at Berwyn or Sister, Illinois, and this is a, a crane that's unloading coal alongside one of the commuter stations, and you may remember that in the old days they used coal-fired furnaces to heat the commuter stations. Now we are on the Milwaukee Railroad, traveling somewhere west between Western Avenue in Chicago and the large rail yard out at Schiller Park, which is just underneath the toll road. In this scene, they are replacing a switch, and you can see them handling the fog, which is a part of the switch, which is being put into place. The Milwaukee, by the way, is now owned by the Sioux Line Railroad. Here's another scene on the Milwaukee Railroad where they have fitted a magnet attachment onto the crane. The crane is being utilized to unload pack materials, which consists of pie plates, spikes, joint bars, and miscellaneous other parts that are put into a store pile. These materials are then sorted by hand with the reusable pieces sent back out on the line and the rest going to the scrapyard. Does it seem possible that at one time there was enough manpower to sort out all of these pieces one by one for salvage? As mentioned previously, the first Model 10 crane was built in 1922, and with the orders for more machines from the Norfolk and Western, a demand for additional manufacturing space came about. Colonel Freestead embarked on a new building with an overhead crane, and to finance it, they sold 6.5% first mortgage gold bonds in the amount of $55,000. These bonds were underwritten by the West Town State Bank at Madison Street and Western Avenue. The prospectus on these bonds stated that the buildings and facilities were worth three times the amount of the bonds. Here we are on the old Missouri Pacific Railroad. This has subsequently been absorbed into the Union Pacific. <clears throat> this is the first time that an attempt had ever been made to put a shovel front type of ditcher onto a crane that ran on railroad tracks. The unit was highly successful. Here we are on our first days with this brand new machine making its first test. After we completed some initial testing, two uh, air dump cars and a caboose were put together with the ditcher and the machine was put into production at Tocosi, Missouri. In this particular location, the Missouri Pacific had a great deal of trouble with water accumulating from heavy rains and causing flooding over the tracks. And the only way to get rid of the water was to put a ditch alongside the tracks and bringing in other types of construction machinery was quite difficult through this uh, cut in the uh, hillside. That bucket picks up three quarters of a cubic yard of material on every lift. Actually, to get almost one yard with all of the heat material. 
Those air dump rail cars can accommodate 30 cubic yards of material in each one. Cone Creek does business prior to the introduction of the Crane Derrick car or Model 10 was primary bridge building utilizing concrete. Several bridges were built in Chicago, including one or two over the Chicago River in downtown Chicago, the Montrose Avenue Bridge over the North Branch of the Chicago River, possibly the Damon Avenue Bridge over the South Branch of the Chicago River, and several other areas. Some old records indicate that back in 1908 or 1909, they built what was then supposed to have been the longest concrete arch bridge in the world, consisting of eight or nine arches across the Lehigh River between Allentown and Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. There is also some old records on the construction of what was supposed to have been the highest concrete arch bridge in the world over the Cuyahoga River somewhere near Cleveland, Ohio. This bridge was built somewhere between 1912 and 1914. There were numerous other bridge construction jobs, including Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario, Buffalo, New York, Lehigh, Pennsylvania, Akron, Ohio, Winchester, Kentucky, and Peoria, Illinois. About two-thirds of the bridge work was for highway, and the other one-third was usually for a railroad. The company also did some miscellaneous projects in the Chicago area, including moving of buildings and the supply and installation of copper counterweight in the Wall Street Bridge over the Chicago River. That copper counterweight is probably still there, by the way. After the two uh, cars were loaded with material, the crane, acting as its own locomotive, uh, takes the entire consist on up to a dumping ground. And here you can see the first car load being dumped. It takes a, a few seconds for the air to pump up in order for the uh, car to return back to its normal position. Then they're able to dump the other car and then return back to the digging site. Colin Priest says bridge building and contracting business gave way to building cranes as more railroads saw the Model 10 and placed orders. The business progressed fairly well until the Depression, and an interesting consequence of the Depression was the Cullen Freestead 6.5% first mortgage gold bonds. The Westtown State Bank had provided a mortgage to the company when the bonds came due in 1930. The bank subsequently went broke and the Mars Candy Company ended up taking over the mortgage, which the company eventually paid off in 1939. Now we find ourselves back on the Pennsylvania Railroad, somewhere south of 106th and Indianapolis Boulevard. It appears that those are some steel mill buildings in the background. The Pennsylvania used small push cars for transporting their small machines as well as materials to do track maintenance and repairs. Now we're back on the Burlington Railroad at Downers Grove, Illinois, and they are laying uh, regular 39 foot long uh, railroad rails. The crew goes along ahead with lining bars and rolls the old rail to the side. Then the crane picks up the new rail and sets it on the tie plates and rolls forward on the rail without any spikes being put in place. This is on the old Wabash Railroad, somewhere around Decatur, Illinois. The Wabash uh, eventually became part of the Norfolk and Western, and the Norfolk and Western ultimately became part of the Norfolk Southern. 
This was one of the first times that two 39-foot rails were welded together to make a 78-foot long rail, thus eliminating every other rail joint. Cullen Freestead built that spreader bar and rail tong assembly for handling these long rails. Here again, the crane can travel on over the new rail before any spikes have been put into place. Now we are on the Illinois Central Railroad at Forest City, Iowa. This crane is threading 1,443 foot strings of welded rail from the shoulder of the uh, track bed up into the center of the tracks. This is 37 uh, rails welded together into one piece. This is on the Sioux Line Railroad somewhere out in North Dakota. What they're doing here is setting the new welded rail directly from the shoulder onto the tie plates. Now we're on the Pennsylvania Railroad, somewhere around Shreerville, Indiana. You can see that they are pushing a bunch of small push carts with their machinery on it. This is how the Pensy used to transport their equipment. The next scene is an old Model 15 crane, and we're demonstrating how the crane can be set off of the track. In this particular instance, the crane was working on a single track railroad, and in order to get the burrow out of the way so that a freight train could pass, it was necessary to, to get the burrow off the track. One end of the crane can be raised by taking the hoist line and grabbing onto the rail and raising the back end so that a cross rail can be put under. Then the crane is rotated to the opposite end, and the same procedure is followed, and the crane can travel off onto a small wayside ramp that has been pre-constructed. Once the crane is off the track, then the rails that were used for the transverse movement are taken out of the way and the train can pass by. To get the crane back on the track, the procedure is reversed. The crane in this scene is a Model 15, introduced in 1931. This superseded the second crane, the Model 20, that was introduced in 1927 and was the first crane to have a 360-degree continuous revolving upper works. Now that everything is clear, we see a modern locomotive of the New York Central Railroad passing through. Here we are on the old Chicago and Eastern Illinois Railroad, which later became part of the Missouri Pacific, and then the Missouri Pacific became part of the Union Pacific. This machine is loaded on top of a rail car, and they want to get it down on the ground for work. And what they have done is built a steel ramp that can be put to the end of the car, and then the crane will unload itself from the top of the car down onto the rails. This was a Model 30 crane, which had 7.5 ton capacity and was introduced in the late 1930s. Several hundred of these were built for the U.S. military during World War II. At about the same time the Model 30 was introduced, Colin Priest also started the manufacture of welding positioners, and during World War II several thousand machines were built for Navy yards, tank plants, 
and other manufacturers of military equipment. During the war, the factory worked 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and many of the workers slept in the basement of the office. Now we are on the L&N Railroad, somewhere around Flora, Alabama, which is in the southern part of the state. What they're doing here is picking up 39-foot panel sections of track and putting them into gondolas, which in this case were transported up to uh, Cincinnati or Russellville, Kentucky, where they were constructing a new rail yard. And these panels were just taken out of the car and put right back on the ground and connected again. That lifting device was also designed and built by Cullen Freestead. The crane shown in this scene is a Model 40, rated 12 and a half ton lifting capacity, and was introduced in 1950. This crane was built because of the heavier weight rail being utilized by the railroads, and also the need to have a crane that would lay the 78 foot rails that was shown in the scene on the Wabash Railroad. We're back again on the Missouri Pacific Railroad, this time I believe at DeSoto, Missouri, working with the ditcher. You will note that the operator of this machine has become quite proficient and is able to load the dump car to overflowing. In fact, the operator has uncoupled the ditcher from the rail car and backed away a little bit so he can fill the dumper all the way to the end. When he has the car full, he'll couple up and then they'll travel off to the dump site. Besides building the locomotive cranes and welding positioners, Cullen Freestead also became involved in building grabs and tongs utilized for lifting sheets and coils of steel. One of the neighbors, Corey Steel Company, came into the shop one day and asked if a lifting device for picking up sheet packs and hung on an overhead crane could be built and lo and behold Cullen Freestead produced one and this started another phase of the business that produced thousands of special lifters and grabs that are utilized in all of the steel mills, aluminum companies, automotive plants, appliance manufacturers and other industries that use sheet and coil material. Now that they've completed the dumping, they're on their way back to doing some more digging. The crane with a couple of cars can travel comfortably at speeds of 15 to 20 miles an hour. And when they get on flat and level track, they can make speeds up to 30 miles an hour. Another point of interest is that Cullen Freestead built the first full revolving crane mounted on a rubber tired carrier in 1931 and 1932. They weren't happy with the stability of the machine, and apparently because they were busy with the rail cranes, they did nothing with it. In 1939, Bresiris Erie came to Colin Freestead and paid license fees to use their patent in order to build self-propelled rubber tire cranes. This is the C&O Railroad at Traverse City, Michigan, with a Model 15 crane that has been fitted with a snowblower that it was designed and built by the C&O in their own shops. We had some places where the snow was six and seven feet deep and in order to penetrate, the blower was raised up uh, three feet off the track and it pushed into the snow to make one cut. Then the crane had to back up, drop the blower down onto the track and go in as far as it could then pick it up again and push into the top half of the snow and continue this procedure until they made it all the way through the cut. Our next scene is a Model 40 crane that is on the Canadian National Railway at their large yard east of Montreal, Quebec. One of the engineers on the Canadian National decided that they would try and set a world record for a burrow crane pulling the most cars. They are coupled on to 11 cars here and the gondolas were all loaded with rails and as you will see they were able to pull this string of cars quite easily.
Colonel Priest had also became involved in manufacturing the Sawyer Barrier, which is a cable assembly supported by two pillars on the side of the road and is lowered down across the traffic lanes when a bridge is raised. The most famous of these barriers was on the Michigan Avenue Bridge over the Chicago River, where they were in service until the late 1980s when some bridge repairs were done. There are still a pair of these barriers on the Congress Street Expressway over the Chicago River just east of the post office. These barriers were installed in quite a number of cities all around the United States. Now we are on the Quebec, North Shore, and Labrador Railroad that runs from Sept Isles and Port Cartier in Quebec straight north into the iron ore fields in Labrador. This railroad was built by U.S. Steel right into the wilderness and over tundra terrain in some places. The crane, as you can see, is hauling a carload of rail and another gondola car with some other materials and all of the workmen from their railhead out to the job site. The roadbed had been prepared and the ties had been put in place and when the burrow comes out it has to swing around and pick up a rail from the car behind and lay it out on the ties ahead and as the rails are put onto the ties then the crane with its cars can travel forward. Now we are on the Burlington Railroad at um, Batavia, Illinois, where they have a chainsaw type of brush cutter mounted on a special boom for the burrow crane. The railroads had a considerable amount of problem with trees and brush growing up into the wires of their communication lines alongside the track. The railroads tried to keep the pole lines as close to the rails as possible, but in many instances, due to the terrain, the pole line could be a distance of 30 to 50 feet from the tracks and also they had to encounter up and down terrain. The brush cutter that we see here had the advantage of being able to reach as far out as necessary and also could cut downhill or uphill under the wires and around the poles as you can see. This is out on the Santa Fe Railroad, somewhere near Streeter, Illinois. They are threading the quarter mile strings of welded rail from the shoulder up into the center of the track in preparation for laying the strings of rail into the track, which we will see momentarily. That device hanging on the cable of the crane is a threader, which consists of a series of rollers, and the threader also has a cable attached onto the undercarriage of the crane so that the threader is pulled along uniformly as the crane is traveling. If you look closely, you will see a train that is stopped on the other track waiting for the rail crew to stop working for a moment. After the rail has been threaded up into the track, 
a magnet was fitted on the crane and the crane now lifts out the old rails picking up one end and moving it to the side then moving back to pick up the far end and move it to the side then the crane goes back and sweeps up all of the old tie plates spikes rail anchors joint bars bolts and nuts and any other loose material and deposits these materials in small piles which were picked up by a scrap crew later on. In this operation, the tops of the ties are milled off, then new tie plates are set in place, and another bow crane coming from behind sets the long strings of rail onto the new tie plates. Cullen Freestud was sold to Federal Sign and Signal in 1968 and was merged with Western Railroad Supply, another federal company, to become the Western Cullen Division of Federal. In 1973, Federal spun off the old Cullen Freestead Company to some private investors who changed the name to Burrow Crane, Inc. The owners of Burrow Crane closed the old Cullen Freestead factory in October of 1990 and shifted all of the manufacturing to Badger Crane at Winona, Minnesota. This is a, another brush cutter on a C&O crane operating in West Virginia. The brush cutter head on this unit is similar to a rotary blade on a lawnmower. The rotary cutter head was much faster in operation and required considerably less maintenance than the old chainsaw brush cutter that was shown on the Burlington Railroad. This unit also had the capability to reach 30 to 50 feet from the track and to work on up and down terrain. Uh, here we are back on the l and Railroad in Alabama where they're picking up the 39-foot uh, uh, sections of panel track and loading them into gondolas. This is on the Santa Fe Railroad at Jerome, Arizona. <clears throat> These were taken from color slides and we hope to have better shots. This shows some beautiful pictures of the Arizona desert, but it doesn't turn out very well. This uh, ditcher, by the way, uh, was tipped over down the side of that hill about the fifth day it was in operation. Here we are in the backyard of the uh, Cullen Freestud factory. That's a burrow crane for Great Lakes Steel there, and you can see the old gas tank in the background. Here inside the plant, we are showing as best possible from some old slides some Model 30 cranes that are all boxed up for export to Brazil. <clears throat> this was a big sheet lifter that we built for either Aluminum Company of America or Reynolds Metals. The capacity of this unit I think was about uh, 45 ton. It's about 60 feet long and it opens up to something like 12 feet wide and those legs are about 6 feet deep. Well folks, that concludes the Cullen Freestead story. We hope you all enjoyed it.